The Week in Bible Prophecy, a Prophecy Watchers podcast. Welcome to the podcast today, everyone. Mondo Gonzalez here in studio with Lee Brainerd. Welcome, Lee. Mondo, I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad we're talking about the pre-tribulation rapture. Yes, we, we, Lee has a, a, a new book out, which we're going to be discussing. And, but I want to remind everybody a couple things, a couple in-house items. First of all, you know, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do. Uh, we have uh, an opportunity to. We want. We're trying to grow this channel, at least for subscribers, because we anticipate uh, possibly one day that our main channel is going to be uh, censored, and so we're trying to get the word out that we are over here as well, uh, once a week, bringing to you a, a podcast topic, and then also uh, just a reminder to everybody to join us uh, in Branson. Uh, we're Branson, Missouri. We're going to be there December fifth through eighth. Lee's going to be there with us. And uh, Christmas in Branson, what's not to like? I mean, I, I was reading that Branson, uh, there, what, some of the most enjoyable time of the year to be there, it's, it's, it's relatively mild, it's not quite February yet, um, is in December. And we're going to be there in early December for a conference. Uh, we're going to have over 20 speakers. It's going to be a great time. You can go to prophecywatchers.com, scroll down to the banner, check it out. And also... If you can't be there in person, you can join this live stream. Again, so much is going to be happening. Also, Lee, it'll be interesting because this will be just a few weeks after the November election, assuming that the November election happens as uh, hoped and that uh, the election isn't, uh, isn't messed with, stolen, interfered, whatever words you want to have. And that there's a peaceful, uh, there's a peaceful uh, event there. But so a lot of the, t- the prophecy teachers will have a lot to discuss as it relates to which direction are we going to go? Which way will we see our country going? Because there's no doubt in the prophetic world, our country has a, uh, has a part to play in, you know, in globalism. Whether we're going to continue to hinder it or whether we are going to uh, become less of a hindrance to what the elites are trying to do. Would you agree with that, Lee? Oh, Absolutely. America is going to be in this picture in the near future, and it's just a matter of waiting to see which direction she goes. Is she going to, going to go her own independent way? Is she going to get in line? Is she going to try and dominate? Yeah, and with, with the latest things that we're seeing, and this kind of goes into what we're talking about with your book, uh, 10 Potent Proofs for the Pre-Tribulation Rapture, but it, it just it helps us set the stage to see, or help us, helps us to see where the stage is at because for us who believe the rapture is before the tribulation, um, the Bible never said that we would escape uh, trouble, uh, that the, even the, that the church would not escape trouble. Of course, we're going to have trouble. It did never promise that we would escape seeing the system uh, being developed. Uh, we could even see that, that a full cashless society being implemented. Uh, we could see other mandates being implemented, as we saw a few years ago, at least attempts. And so the church, maybe this is a good lead, a good lead up, because people accuse those in the pre-trib camp, which again we're going to be talking about the proofs of that. But people accuse those in the pre-trib camp that they're just a bunch of escapists. But yet, in one sense, that's true. Jesus uses the word escape in Luke twenty-one. Paul uses the word escape in First Thessalonians five. So we have some biblical things, but. Maybe talk about that for a moment. What we are we we are going to escape something, but what is it that we're promised to escape, and also what is it that we're not necessarily promised to escape? Well, we're not promised to escape tribulation in the general sense. The church has been in tribulation for two thousand years, in every continent, in every nation where there's been believers, they've suffered tribulation. And right now, today, if you go to Iran, you go to North Korea, you go to China. The church is suffering tremendously. In parts of Africa, she's suffering tremendously under Islam. Other parts, she's suffering tremendously under starvation and difficult situations. Mm -hmm. The church does not have it easy in the world. And even in America, you stop and think about it. We don't have persecution like we're going to get thrown in jail on a regular basis. We're not facing death threats. But many a young person in our generation is turning from the faith because they're, they could not withstand the persecution of ridicule and slander and mocking. This is tribulation, and we face it. Now, the tribulation we're not going to face is when all the tribulation uh, in the world, whether it's tribulation that's man giving tribulation to other human beings, or whether it's God's tribulations that he brings upon the world, these things are going to go up and uh, significantly 
not just up a notch or two, not just up a peg or two. When we look at the persecution of the Jews under Hitler, we have seen estimates that one third of the Jews in the world perished. When we look at Zechariah chapter 13, we see two thirds of the Jews perishing in the tribulation. We're looking at a situation here where the death toll on the Jews is twice as severe as Hitler's persecution. This is why the Bible says this is tribulation such as the world has never seen before. This is the same tribulation taken to levels man has never experienced before. But on another level, we come to tribulation in the sense that God's bringing tribulations upon mankind. The fourth seal alone takes one quarter of the world's population. If the world's population is 8 billion, we're looking at 2 billion people perishing. This is 20 times the death toll for World War II if you include battlefield deaths, deaths from famine, and deaths from disease and pestilence. 100 million is the, the highest death toll I've seen estimated for World War II, 20 times. So we're looking at a very, very different degree of tribulation. Yeah, let, let, let's, that, that's worth reiterating where uh, in Mark 13, 19, you know, Jesus says that this time of trouble, which is not just the second half of the tribulation, as you mentioned, the, the, the four seal is probably relatively early in, in the seven-year uh, tribulation, where you have uh, immediately we have war breakout uh, in the second seal. But Jesus said in Mark 13, 19, that this, is, this time of trouble is the greatest in the history, not just of the world, we can say that's fine, but in the history from the beginning of creation. That's right. So if you think about that, that includes the flood. I mean, that's a weird way to say it. I mean, the flood just wiped everybody out in, in, in the sense of um, you drowned. I mean, the, the waters came, you drowned. I'm not sure what, what, what other way you would die. I mean, maybe a landslide or something. But if we compare that this time of trouble, this seven-year period, is worse than the flood, and, and then you, you start just looking at all the different descriptions, as you mentioned, the entire period, in, enough that Jesus said if it continued, if it wasn't cut short to seven years, nobody, nobody, not just the Jews, but nobody on earth would, no human, pre humanity would survive. Yeah, that's, to me, that observation there speaks volumes. Where we have the Lord's commentary on it, and he says, if I didn't limit these days to seven years, they're so severe, there wouldn't be a single soul left. And I, I think your point is spot on. Yeah, so, so as we think about that, when we discuss a very intentional period of time, the 70th week of Daniel, the day of the Lord, a lot of different names for this time, this seven-year period, um, this time of trouble is unlike anything else. And that, we, we I know as pre-trib, uh, we consider the entire period the wrath of God. Um, and so that is what we are escaping. First Thessalonians 5, again, we're, 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 we're delivered from, we're rescued from, uh, in chapter 1 as well, we're, we're from the, this wrath, this eschatological wrath. I think the other thing is, as we think about this, there's, there's, there's this distinction that people like want to see between um, when, the, when the tribulation starts and when it does not the seals. But the... In Revelation 6, 1, you mentioned earlier that we, we, we talk about the phrases of man's wrath versus Satan's wrath, uh, because Satan's wrath does appear in Revelation 12. But in Isaiah chapter 10, God talks about Assyria yeah. being his wrath, very specific um, against Israel and others. And so just because we see the Antichrist come on the scene and there's there's war that takes place and there, the ramifications and then also the the consequences, the collateral damage that happens through war, famine, pestilence, etc. Um, it's not like, oh, well, this is just from man. God, who's the one that opened the first seal? It was the lamb. That's right. And it was the supernatural agency of the angels. So this unleashing still is God's unleashing it upon the world. It's still from his hand, is it not? Absolutely. I think really what we're talking about here then is, well, the removal of the restraining influence or the removal of the restrainer. When God ceases to restrain the mystery of iniquity, he is going to let the angelic realm go to degrees and directions he's not allowed them to go. 
He's going to let human beings go in directions, in degrees that he's not allowed them to go. He's been putting the brakes on for the last 6,000 years. And all of a sudden, he's going to take the brakes off. He's going to remove his restraining hand, and they're going to run amok on planet Earth. Yeah, and so that 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 opening of the first seal and, and the... The um, the arrival of the figure. Now let, let me let me just say this too. This is important because it, some people can be confused that um, the first writer is is referring to a specific human being, uh, the Antichrist, uh, and then the second writer. I, I have an issue with that. It, it, what and I'll tell you what I mean by that is if you look at the other writers. The other writer, the second writer, is bringing war. Well, it's not bringing a human being. The third writer is bringing, you know, pestilence or whatever, death. Um, that's not bringing a human being. And so, but it's still a judgment. So let me explain what I mean. You can you can add to it. Is I think that the first horse is a unleashing of the the the. These are figurative, right? They are figurative. Okay, they are pointing to something. They're pointing to something real. It could be pointing to the, a literal a human figure. I'm not. That's. I'm not bound by that. But it also could be pointing the arrival of the system, the, the B system, which appears on the scene and then begins to consolidate. Which again would include a figure yeah. uh, or a person. But all these things being unleashed, there's a system now that is. It's. It's. Go for it. Finalize your system. Because we know that the Antichrist is going to take full tyrannical authority uh, as an autocrat in the middle. Yeah. He's going to be there, though. But this is his, his time where he's released. He's on the scene now, right? He's released on the scene, but he begins to solidify the system, the B system and the governments, with, along with the, the Ten Kings or whatever that looks like, the Ten Figures, because he has an agenda. But he's not going to – well, you can correct me here, but let's talk about – is he going to arrive on the scene on day one as a full dictator of the whole earth? Absolutely not. Yeah. It's going to take a little while – for everything to be set up, and then he's once he's established, uh, then he's going to assert control over the ten kings, and we know that three are going to fall in that process. Mm -hmm. And then once that's done, then he's going to assert his control over Israel and the rest of the world. Yeah, we see that happening in the midpoint, where the, really the midpoint is where there's a mortal wound. Uh, he goes and declares himself to be God. He's allegedly resurrected. Uh, then he he goes to be this tyrannical autocrat where he establishes the mark of the beast, etc. Okay, so, I do I do want to take up one point though. You mentioned the seals, and I want to reinforce the point you made about consistency in our interpretation principles. If we're going to say that the rider on the first horse is a human being, you would think that the riders on the second and third and and the fourth and fifth horses under the fourth seal would also be human beings. But since the other ones are angelic beings or figurative, you can, mm -hmm. okay, that was, that's where we have to go with the first one. Now, personally, I think each of the riders on those horses is literal angelic messengers. I wouldn't be surprised that the first one is Satan himself because he mm. is the one that's going to be ruling here on earth. The dragon, yeah, clearly. It's his it's his authority he's been given. Mm -hmm. And in the early church, it's interesting to see the fathers jump back and forth between calling the beast the dragon and calling the dragon the beast. And they're they're dealing with the same tension that you were just addressing. Yeah, no, that, that that's well said. I mean, I, I could go along with that perfectly. It's it just, it's that consistency yeah. that I, I struggled with and going, well, you know, because everyone's like, well, that's the Antichrist. He's got a bow. He's he's going around. Is he on a literal horse? Is is Maybe he has a, a nine millimeter with no bullets. I mean, you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, that's a little bit too, that's actually taking uh, this imagery and uh, and and sometimes making it a little bit too literal, yeah. Uh, especially because we are dealing with with imagery, we're dealing with colors. I mean, uh, what what does that represent? But nevertheless, I think what we know is this: your book, ten potent proofs for the pre-tribulation rapture. Um, you have in there the word tribulation, and you have the word pre. So we want to understand this tribulation period and how it's distinct from just times of trouble. And so these people that accuse us of escapism, or especially Americans, uh, people accuse... You see people in other countries get upset at, at American pre-tribulational teaching because they're like, yeah, you guys think you get to escape everything. What gives you, just because you're American Christians, that, that, you know, that you don't have to deal with trouble? And it's like, hey, wait a minute. We never said that. And if people are saying that, then it's a, it's a misunderstanding mis, uh, or misrepresentation of the pre-trib doctrine. No, Absolutely. 
No teacher that I know in the pre-tribulation rapture camp has ever taught that Christians can't see tribulation. Um, that's a complete misunderstanding. The, the world is filled with believers in tribulation. And we even have tribulations here in America. Now, most of us don't feel really strong tribulations, but if someone is getting thrown in jail or fined because of their stand on the alphabet issue and they're not going to, you know, they're, they're working in their bakery and they refuse to, to bake for certain parties or they refuse to admit certain parties, they face tribulation over that. And that's, it's real and it's painful. The pre-tribulation rapture position is saying that there's a period of exceptional tribulation at the end of the age, which is going to go far beyond in degree any tribulation in the previous history of the world. It's going to take the world where they've never been before, not only in seeing persecution worse than they've ever seen before, uh, but in seeing what we would regard as acts of God to a degree they've never seen before with earthquakes mm -hmm. and... and um, visitations from asteroids and comets from space. Blood, water turning to blood, poisons, bitterness, wormwood. I mean, let, you name it, right? And then supernatural manifestations way beyond what the world has ever seen before. Yeah. So that's what the tribulation is that we get delivered from. Yeah. And we don't get delivered from that merely and only because the church can't see tribulation. We get delivered from it because this tribulation is severe enough, it falls under the category of judgment. You know, I want to say something else, too, which I think is important here, because, again, we're, we're talking about um, one of your proofs in here is talking about the wrath. And, yes. and if, we have to talk about that. But what I find interesting is that you have four main views. You got the pre-trib view, you got the mid-trib view, you got the post-trib view, and then you have the pre-wrath, which is kind of a three-quarter view. Yep. Three-quarter rapture view it, within there. The pre-trib position says very clearly that there are no church people in the eschatological wrath of God. That's right. Now, again, a pre-wrath says, oh, well, they're pre-wrath, so the wrath is only the last quarter, and therefore they're pulled out. So they're, they're not pre-trib. We, we believe the entire tribulation seven-year period is the wrath. So if they believe that, well, then they would be pre-trib too. They would be pre-70th week, pre day of the Lord, whatever. But what I find interesting here, Lee, get your thoughts on this, is that I've try, tried to note that the pre-wrath, pre-wrath, mid-trib, and post-trib all believe that there are no believers in the eschatological wrath. That's right. The pre-trib says, no, there are believers in the eschatological wrath, but they're tribulation saints. It's just not the church. That's right. So we look at it. We're the only ones that say there are, there are believers in the wrath of God that happen on the earth where all of them say, no, they're pulled out before. Even the post-trib, they believe the last 24 hours is the wrath of God, and they're rescued, they're, they're raptured. I don't know where they're hanging for 24 hours, but they're hanging for the, before that last 24-hour period of the wrath of God. But we go, no, no, no. And so here, here's why I bring this up. It's, it's another evidence of why the pre-tribulation rapture is true, because in Revelation 7, you have these martyrs, that uh, the great multitude, right? yep. they're coming up and it says um, all these, there, there are no more tears, um, no more pain, no more sorrow. And it says, and the sun will not scorch them anymore. You know, like these, and it says, who are these? These are those that are coming out of the great tribulation. These are believers. Yeah. And they have come out and the sun has scorched them. Well, I find it interesting. If you go to Revelation 16, same, same Greek words. These are very specific. It only appears a couple of times in Revelation 16, eight and nine. One of the, the bowls is where the sun yep. gets hot. This is, a, this is wrath. This yep. is one of the bowls of wrath. And it says clearly that the, the sun gets such degree that it uses two words. It uses scorching and it uses heat. And it says, the scorching and the heat come upon all the people on the earth. Well, Revelation 7 just told us th that these believers experienced that right. wrath of God. And in my mind, I'm thinking... Hey, pre-wrath, I thought you said there were no believers there. Yeah. Post-trib, I thought you said there was no believers there. Mid-trib, there's no believers there. These believers are experiencing the wrath of God in, in a collateral way because Revelation 7 says clearly they did. But for a pre-trib, we go, well, that's no problem with our view. 
because we think there are believers there. That's exactly. And they are going to experience. That's why they need to get out before the, you know, in the rapture, because there will be believers that experience some parts of the bulls of wrath. We're the only, we're the only group that teaches that. And I think it matches up with Revelation. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, even when we come to the end of the book of Revelation, late in there, we get into Revelation chapter 18. We read, come out of her, my people, lest you be a partaker of her sins. It's talking mm-hmm. about If you don't leave, you're going to experience the same judgment that's fallen on them. Yes. And so here the Lord, again, a a clear evidence that there will be believers in the tribulation that are going to, can experience the judgment. Now we have clear promises, especially for the Jewish remnant, that some of them are going to be preserved miraculously Mm -hmm. all the way through. But that promise does not apply to every Jew, and it certainly does not apply to the Gentiles in general. Yep, and we know that by the end, that um, even though, uh, you know, maybe some believers, uh, you know, who are scorched by the sun, maybe some of them go underground, they're able to avoid that. So we obviously know that there's believing Gentiles at the end of the tribulation, just like there are believing Jews, the one-third that make it. And so, but for the most part, you got four billion people dead yeah at least you know at least pro- probably e- even more so so let, let's jump into your book here because you 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 were hearing to talk about why you wrote this book this is this is relatively recent um and uh we know that the preacher position is very attacked um it's very misunderstood it's very misrepresented so talk about why you decided to put these 10 uh proofs together well i've observed that there's a tremendous and increasing attack on the pre-tribulation rapture. And it comes from a lot of quarters. It comes from those that believe in a post-trib rapture. It comes from those that believe in a pre-trib rapture. It comes from people that are post-millennial trying to establish the kingdom on earth. And they just don't have any time of day for any kind of prophecy. So in the midst of all this attack, and one of the common arguments you hear is, there is no proof at all in the Bible. Not a single a, verse. Yeah, not a single verse uh-huh. for a pre-trib rapture. And you, when I hear these arguments, I, my first inclination is, oh, these people haven't even read the Bible. <laughs> but it turns out that some of them have, and they're just living in deep-seated prejudice. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to respond to this. Now, there's probably not much chance that people that are really strongly convinced of a post-trib rapture, for instance, are going to be convinced by a book that I might write. But if people are not super strong in their prejudice and they're just inclined that way, or if they're on the fence, then maybe a book like this can help. So what I did is I brought proof of a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, some people don't want to talk about proof of a pre-trib rapture. They'd rather talk about, well, I'm inclined to believe in a pre-trib rapture, or they might say, this is my opinion. I might be wrong. Well, I can't go there because I don't believe that my belief in a pre-trib rapture is my opinion. I don't believe it is opinion. This is Lee Brainerd looking at the Bible and seeing God-written words that teach a pre-tribulation rapture or demand or necessitate a pre-tribulation rapture. So if someone wants to talk about an opinion, they're going to have to talk about God's opinion. Mm -hmm. And so when I put together 10 proofs I made each chapter a distinct argument for a pre-tribulation rapture that even person, a person who's not a strong reader can sit down at night and read one chapter a night. The book is only about 100 pages. And that was my goal, to give people proof for a pre-tribulation rapture so they can get off the fence or so they can be strengthened or maybe even delivered. You know, it's interesting because when I was listening to a program, I don't know, and they were talking about, we, uh, we're offering $10,000 for anybody who can give us a single verse, you know, for, um, for the pre-tribulation rapture. It's just not there. And then, uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you what, I could send in this book. And I got 10 proofs here, and I'll split the 10, I'll split the 10,000 with you, even though you wrote it. But since I'm reaching out, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah, my cut. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But they're going to get this book, and they're going to go, yeah, we disagree with your interpretation. So the idea of offering a, a, a ten thousand is just—it's a gimmick. It's, yeah. it's sensationalism at 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 its, at its best, because all they got to do is say, "Well, again, you're interpreting it wrong." So l- l- I'm going to discuss that for a minute because uh, let let me let me say it this way, without getting into offending any uh, you know King James only people. That's not my goal. Uh, but when we look, for example, I, I'll, I'll 
I had this problem um, years ago when I first became a Christian. Uh, first became a Christian, I'm reading the Bible and I'm memorizing Scripture, and I, and my my Bible of choice at the time was a New King James version, which was uh, based on the majority text. Yep. Okay, Tr- uh, Greek manuscript trans- uh, tradition. I didn't know that at the time. I'm just reading the New King James. And uh, as I'm reading along, I come to First John five seven. Yep. There are three that bear witness in heaven: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. I thought, whoa, that's a great verse for the Trinity. Yeah. So in my enthusiasm, I'm evangelizing. I'm, I'm talking to a Jehovah's Witness, and man, I whip out First John five seven like a hammer, baby. I mean, they they said there's no proof of the Trinity, man. And and here's my hammer verse. Yeah. And they said. Well, don't you know that that's not in the earliest manuscripts? And I was like, what? I didn't understand at the time textual criticism or understanding manuscript tradition or whatever. And I thought, oh. And clearly, I would say that um, that was uh, the earliest manuscripts don't have that. So later, in in my view, as you have copyists and editors, uh, I believe they added that. You know, somebody added that in and in- introduced it into uh, the manuscript tradition at some time, and then it, it became the majority uh, later. Um, but it's not in some of the earliest manuscripts. So that, again, from textual criticism principles, you would say it was added later by somebody who was trying to be help. He was trying to help. My point in all that is simply to say that is a great verse for the Trinity. But if we don't have that because it doesn't exist in the earliest manuscripts, how do we defend the Trinity? Yep. I mean, what verses do we have for the Trinity? Is th- th- that that very clear? That that's a great clear. It's yep. very logical. There's no ambiguity. These three are one. But if we don't have that to appeal to, do we believe in the Trinity? Yes. But God has put a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit over here to make us think and explore and exegete the passages. And then when we take the collective idea of, 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 of systematic theology or theology of the Bible, we come and we go, no, the, the Trinity is very defensible, even though we don't have that First John 5, 7, That's which right. came later. You know, maybe Matthew 28, you're baptized in the name, singular of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But apart from that, John let 1... Us. Make man. Let yeah. us make man in our image. Yeah. But that's not clear, Lee. Yeah. I mean, we can read. It doesn't say let us three, yeah. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit make man in our image. So what God, I'm not saying you're wrong, yeah. but it's it's God has put his theology, yeah. a truth like the Trinity, the triunity of God. He's put a little bit here like that. That's, yeah. a, that's a little hint. He's put a little hint over here. He's, but he expects us to do our due diligence and to read. So in the same way, I think that the pre-trib rapture is um, stronger than that. I think it's even yep. stronger than the Trini- Trinity um, view in the sense of evidence. But why doesn't it say, hey, everyone, you will be delivered from the exact seven-year period, which is called the day of the Lord, the wrath of God, etc. Prior, you won't even see the Antichrist. See, when they say that we want this verse, they want it to be written like that. Yeah. And it's not written like that in the Bible, is it? No. What we have, just similar to a piecemeal presentation of the Trinity, a piecemeal presentation of any theological doctrine that we want to take up, we have a piecemeal presentation of the pre-trib rapture. We have a piecemeal presentation of the 70th week. We have a piecemeal presentation of the Antichrist. This is just the way the Bible is written. Now, the Lord wants us to use our God-given reason on the God-given revelation and come to conclusions that would pass muster in the court of heaven, where you present the the evidence and you come to a conclusion, and then you test it against other passages of Scripture and you modify your conclusions until you have a, a position that doesn't offend on any passage of Scripture that, adju- that that addresses the subject. And we do this with the pre-tribulation rapture. We, we take, for instance, the promises that the uh, 70th week is addressed to the Jews and not to the church. We take passages of promise from the the church will be delivered from the wrath to come. We take passages which present the church in heaven Mm -hmm. before the opening of the first seal in chapter 6, because we see the church in heaven in chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation. Mm -hmm. So we take these kind of arguments, um, and when we put them together, we have a rock-solid 
case for a pre-tribulation rapture. Yeah, and and so let's 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 talk about some of those because obviously uh, we can't cover all of them here in in the remaining time that we have. But I, I think that setting the stage for um, setting the stage for what the tribulation is, I, I thought that was important to do. And so let, let you have here. Uh, let me just read these and, and we'll jump into some of them. Proof number one: the distinct future of Israel. Proof number two, the 70th week appointed for Israel. Proof number three, Israel in the tribulation. Proof number four, deliverance from wrath. We got proof number five, church in heaven, as you just mentioned before the tribulation. Number six, types of the rapture, uh, looking at some of the, uh, the typology that we see. Proof seven, the coming of the Son of Man, as we find uh, a thief in the night, that language, relative normality, I, I like, that's really good in the Element Discourse in Luke 17. Proof eight, the nature of the seals, when does the wrath begin? Uh, proof number nine, rapture and the second coming distinguished, that's really, really important, because that's all, often people are confused about what that looks like, the rapture versus the, what happens at the uh, second coming. And then proof ten, uh, the body and the bride of Christ. So, with some of these, let's jump into a couple of them, which, I mean, if, if, if you did, if you had to go, and, and I'm going to force you here, okay, all you get is one verse. Put your best verse forward, Lee Brainerd. Uh, that's all you get. Not 10, sorry, man. You get one. Um, if you, it's kind of the same way that I was forced with the Trinity. Yep. What what is the the best verse which you think contributes the most? Not only, I mean, we wouldn't yeah. have it all from that one, but which verse contributes the most? If I was only allowed one verse, I would turn to Revelation 3.10. I agree. 100%. Because you have kept the word of my patience or the matter of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to try those who dwell upon the earth, the earth dwellers. Yes. Very clear passage in my mind. Doesn't say I'll keep you or preserve you through that time. It says I will keep you from that time. The very hour itself. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I'm glad, um, I'm glad here you have that as it relates to deliverance from wrath and proof number four. But even in proof number four, uh, deliverance from wrath, not a point of wrath, tribulation and wrath to stink, um, you, wrath comes in degrees, but you have there a couple others. Um, you have Revelation 3.10, but you also have John 14, 1 through 3, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3. Yeah. So talk about the contribution of John 14. Um, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go away to prepare a place for you, so that when I come back, I will receive you unto myself. Um, so, that, how does that contribute to the understanding of not just a rapture, but a preacher rapture? Well, if you look at the passage, what is being presented is the next time the Lord physically interacts with the church, they're not going to go from point A on earth to point B on earth. This is not a post-trib gathering. Mm -hmm. They're going to go to New Jerusalem to be in the Father's house and to dwell in one of the mansions that the Lord has built over the last 2,000 years for each of his believers. Now, if, you, if you're going to think through the ramifications of this, this departure to heaven, there really is no place for this. If you are going to talk, I believe, in a, in a post-trib rapture, where does this going to heaven fit? I mean, you might be able to take a gathering to the clouds and you're hanging around for a day and then you come back down or hang around for a few hours, come back down. But if, if you're going to... to to the heaven to be with Jesus and be with him forever. This just kind of leaves the post-trib rapture concept in the dust. You know, compare that to, in my mind, um, John 14, in isolation, um, in isolation, th there's not a timing factor there. I mean, right. I, I, exegetically, you can see that. But comparing John 14 with Revelation 4 and 5. Yes, that's exactly right. You bring those two to harmonize together, and all of a sudden you're like, whoa. Ex so talk about, explain how that is, because I know you discuss it in the book, but how does those two alone just pretty much establish a strong case? Yeah, well, so we have a promise in John 14 that the church, next time they physically interact with the Lord, are going to be going to the New Jerusalem. We come to Revelation 4 and 5, starting in verse 1, we see a typology of the rapture. Come up here. Come up here. Door open. Come up here. 
Yep. And so John finds himself in heaven. He's looking around. He sees 24 elders gathered around the throne of God in the court of the Lord in heaven. Now, it's pretty common in the commentaries to say, well, we don't really know who these 24 are. They're very, very mysterious creatures. But if you take the hints that are given in Scripture and trust them, it tells us exactly who these 24 are. So, for instance, they these... According to Revelation chapter 5, Hold, verse 9. I, I, I want to interrupt just a second because I'm going to let you go. But when we say hints, actually, I would just say, look for the words. Yes. Look for words. And you're going to talk about the words. So these aren't, they, I, I know you didn't mean it that way, but yeah. I, I don't want people to say, well, what hint? No, no. Look for the words. Look for yes. the descriptors of yes. who these people are, right? Yep. So talk about those. Yes. Okay. The, the, uh, these these words are like clues for a treasure yes, map. Yes, they jump right off the page. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, for instance... We see that they're bought by the blood of Christ. They're blood redeemed. This means they cannot be angels. They cannot be any other kind of creature except human beings. That's uh, Revelation 5, 9. So then we also see that they're seated on thrones. This is in chapter 4. And they're wearing their Stephanos reward crowns. Now, nobody gets their reward with their throne and their crown before the resurrection. So the fact that they have a crown and, and they have their throne means that they have been resurrected already. And they've gone through the judgment seat of Christ. Yes. The, you know, Romans 14, 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. They've already gone through that process and they've come through 1 Corinthians 3 where they've already been judged according, you know, for their works, not salvation, but works, their, their stewardship. And then they've been rewarded now. And now this is like a post-reward Post-reward, like, wait, wait, where, who are these people that have already got their rewards? They're already here with their crowns. Yes. Let me just add this here, too, that these are people sitting on thrones where if you look at any of the things in the Old Testament, Daniel 7, uh, Isaiah 6, there's no, group, there's no group of redeemed sitting on thrones anywhere in those Old Testament throne room scenes. Yes. This is new. That's right. Where did this new group come from? Yes, and you go beyond that. We see that the saints that are seated on these thrones around the Lord, mm -hmm. they watch the Lamb come to the Father, receive the scroll. Now, the scroll is the title deed to the earth. And they get to be there when the Lord starts peeling those seals back on the scroll and reclaiming His rightful inheritance and ownership of the entire globe. And this is before the... The, um, so that they're up there watching when the first seal is opened yeah. in chapter 6. Yeah. So they're there before any of the tribulation. So the church goes up. They go through the judgment seat of Christ. They go into the throne room of God. They're resurrected. They are rewarded. And then they get to watch as the <laughs> seals are opened and the Lord begins His theocratic government on earth. Yeah, that's important because... In John 17, uh, verse 24, um, Jesus makes the claim about that. He goes, Lord, it's my will. It, it, I desire the way it phrases it. It's actually a little stronger. Fellow, it's not like I wish. It's like I will it that, they, that we see Jesus. He says, I want them to see me in my glory. Yes. I want them to see me in my fullness of who I am. And the church hasn't seen that. Not, not physically, but where do you see that? Well, we see it in heaven. So imagine there we are and we get to see him. And now there's the lamb around the throne and we get to see the fullness of his glory begin to be implemented in the earth where, like you said, the opening of the seals is the beginning of his kingdom establishment on earth. Yes. It's going to come with judgment. It's going to come with, it's going to take seven years. That's what he's chosen in order to establish it, but he's got to cleanse. He's got to, he's got to allow humanity this final opportunity. He's going to give the dragon his opportunity for blah, 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 but it is judgment. But we get to see the glory of the lamb begin to take shape and we're front row seats. That's Jesus right. said, it's my will, Lord, that they, see, my father, that they see me right here in it. Absolutely. So we see the promise of going to glory, we see the saints in glory with their reward, and we see them there when the first seal is opened, 
And this you add now in the Revelation 3.10 that we already touched on, and that is the theological description of how they're delivered from the judgment. Yeah, so, I mean, again, we're, we, you know, you've written a whole book on this, which we're just trying to cover a little bit of it. Um, the other, the, talk about the continuity there, the theological, biblical theological continuity between the rapture to being taught in chapter 4 of, Thess of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, 13 through 18. And then immediately in chapter 5, which we know there's no chapter breaks, right, yeah. originally. Chapter 5, he, he begins to talk about the, the seasons, the times, the day of the Lord, peace and safety. Talk about that transition from hope and comfort into more description um, and how the timing of the factor comes into chapter 5. Because well, let me just say it this way. Chapter 4, there's really no timing. We know there's a resurrection, there's a rapture first, but he's not talking about the time because he goes into chapter 5. Yes. So in chapter 4, we see a couple elements that are very encouraging to me. We see the mention of the parousia, which is the coming of the Lord. That's his coming in glory. And it's associated with the apontesis of the parousia. Now, these are Greek words, and it's probably seems a little over the head for some people. What's apontesis for people? And that's where we're going. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Yep, yep. It's, I know it's Greek words that are over people's head. But apontesis is what's translated the meat or the go out to meet. Oh, to meet. Okay. Yeah. And so um, even though it's used in a lot of just everyday Greek usages in everyday Greek, when it comes to the entrance of a king, when he's taking his kingdom or when he's um, owning a new piece of conquered territory, the king would have a royal entrance in, in one of the cities. And so the king would be making his royal entrance or his royal parousia. He would come to the town. His faithful would go out to meet him. They might go out a half day journey, a full day journey, a two day journey, even more than two days. And that's the going out to meet. That's the apontesis. And then they would accompany him in his royal parousia. So the picture here for the church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is that there, the Lord's going to come in his royal entrance to be the king of the earth. But the church is going to go out first at the apontesis or the meeting, and they're going to meet the Lord in the air. And then we're going to, of course, we know from John 14 and Revelation 4 and 5 that we're not immediately coming back down. We're going to spend time in heaven training to reign and preparing to be the bride of Christ. And then we finish that coming with the Lord in his parousia. Now, when we move to chapter 5, it's very interesting because chapter 4 says, um, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. And he explains to them material they're not very familiar with or don't know at all. When we come to chapter 5, he says, now, I don't need to teach you. Nobody needs to teach you about the, day, the times and the seasons. You understand fully. Now we move into the day of the Lord, which is clearly taught in the Old Testament. They were very familiar with it. And it was clearly taught in the Gospels too, the coming of the days of the Son of Man and the coming of the Son of Man. So they were familiar with the subject. And then the Lord walks them through the coming of the day of the Lord, which is going to dawn upon the world like birth pangs upon a woman. It's going to start bad and it's going to increase in intensity and frequency and severity all the way through to the very end. So what a blessing. The church is going to go up in the rapture and be with the Lord forever and and immediately after, when the church is delivered, then this birth pangs of the wrath of God are going to start breaking on the world, and the world is going to have sudden judgment come upon them out of the blue, just like the flood came upon the world in Noah's day out of the blue. Yeah, I think the other thing that you bring up too, which I think is important, is in chapter 5, um, you have this idea of peace and, yes. and safety. And then you can compare that again. You compare that with the chronology of, of Luke 17, Matthew 24, talking just about people are living, they're casual, they're living normally, they're relatively normally, they're buying, they're selling, they're planting, and all of a sudden this, this judgment lands on them. It begins to land on them, and, and they're taken unaware, like, whoa, wait, we weren't expecting this. Again, a thief. Yes. Um, the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. We see that all, all over the scripture. And so when you compare all of these things, again, you're, you're comparing it that the only place that you have relative living, casual living, is before, I mean, think about it. Jesus said that the, the time of trouble is the worst it's ever been in history. 
So it has to come before that. That's right. And if we're looking early on in Revelation chapter 6, not, not long, I mean, in the, second, in the second horse, now we have war and we have major d death. Yeah. So the idea that we have to wait till all the way to the three-quarter position. Yes. And that it's relative nice living all the way up until that time of rescue. That doesn't seem to agree with the rest of Scripture that talks even from the beginning parts of the, the when the seals are opened, the 70th week, yeah. that you're going to have trouble all through there. So the only real place to have that is prior, isn't it? That's right. And what's interesting, the point you're making here is, is very important in my mind because we have people that say that we're in the seals already. Mm -hmm. Right now. And, and we today. have people that say that the, the church is going to go through the seals before the rapture. Well, when you take one of these two positions, you have to dumb those seals down and not take them with the severe degree that, it, that they're stated says, in yeah. Scripture. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is an unnerving, it's a rattling practice. And I... You know, we have some relatively big names out there in the prophecy world that present that position. And I would just wish that they would all just see, wow, if the fourth seal takes a quarter of the world's population, it takes a quarter of the world's population. We haven't seen that yet. No. And peace taken from the entire earth? Yep. World War II didn't take peace from maybe 20% of the surface of yep. the earth. That's it's the that. second seal, right? To yeah. take peace from the earth. Yeah. That's that's early. I yeah. mean, that, and Jesus opens the seal. Right. So that's very early. So that we haven't seen that yet. And we haven't seen um, the what the first seal portrays, which, of course, we know that the rider and the horse can't be the Antichrist himself. But it is the man behind the Antichrist, right. yep. Satan himself. Yep. And the system. And his, yep. his system, his man is going to come rolling forth after the rapture of the church. And in a very short order of time, whether it's a few weeks, few months, a year, it won't be a long period of time. And it will engulf the entire planet. Yeah. Whatever that um, peace and safety mentality has, uh, again, we see it. We see it there. Um, we see it, in, again, in the relatively normal living. Uh, things are great. But I, I, I see in Luke 21 um, where Jesus, you know, don't get caught up in debauchery and drunkenness, you know, lest that day overtake you as a trap. Yes. That's going to come upon, again, that uses the language of the whole world. Um, and so it comes as a surprise. When you're trapped, that means you weren't aware. That's right. And so this day is a day of trouble. It's a day of the Lord. It's, a, it's the whole con uh, context of, of really the whole description from Matt, the, the first part of the Olivet Discourse all the way through. And so here we are. Well, I mean, Lee, kind of running out of time here, but uh, what would you say if, if you had to talk about one more of course, we want people to get the book to see all the full details. But of the ten, um, what's one more that you really uh, you really want to end this on? I love the chapter on the types of the rapture. Um, it's probably not the one that's the most powerful argument for a pre-trib rapture, but it's the one that's the dearest to my heart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have the typology, for instance, of the in chapter six of John, with the disciples are out on the. Sh rowing in the boat mm -hmm. across the sea, the Lord's off in the mountaintop. And this is a picture in my mind of the Lord being up in glory, over watching the church. He's up in heaven. The church is sailing across the sea of life. And at the they get out there in the sea and a tremendous storm comes up and they're terrified and they're losing hope. They're scared. And the Lord appears to them in the middle of the storm. And when they recognize him and receive him, they're immediately at safe harbor where they were going. And to me, this is a picture of the church. At the end of the age, we're going to come into a great storm so that we're going to start worrying and fearing. And in the well, we're in the middle of that storm that just started. We're not going deep into that. It's just mm -hmm. the front edge. It's just barely getting cooked up. And the Lord's going to come to us and take us to our safe haven. Yeah. I mean, we have, we're, we're seeing, hey, as everybody knows right now, I mean, we're seeing socialism in our country we're seeing marxism being snuck in and obviously through the universities and education we're seeing it through the the administration we're, we're seeing censorship now we're seeing biomedical mandates we're seeing being stuck in our house these these are all relatively new for americans yes. you know and so we're seeing these things and we also know that uh, those powers that be 
uh, Klaus Schwab and others, they desire 15-minute cities. They desire to control. They, they tell us we're going to own nothing and be happy. All these things are happening right now, which are troubles and trials. And we know that they had their trial run a few years ago. They're, they, they're talking about monkeypox now and blah, blah, blah. So we, we are not going to escape the seeing the the setting of the stage that's exactly right and, and that's trouble that that is going to bring dif difficulties uh, no doubt around the world for everybody and not just christians and we might see a lot more than we would ever wish to see i and i, I actually in my opinion i do i think that we're going to see we're, we're, we're not quite there yet i i don't think as it relates to the stage setting um i think we're going to see we'll, i think we'll probably be fully implemented into a cashless system which That'll be interesting to see how that plays. Um, it'll be easy evangelism, <laughs> I guess, at that time, because we're like, well, we've been talking about this for, you know, going back to Hal Lindsey in 1970, yeah. um, and here we are. And that just shows us how much closer we are to what you wrote about here, uh, the preacher rapture, when the Lord does come. I mean, relative... Uh, Relative living, Pete Garcia, uh, he, when he he came to me one time when I was talking on the on the Olivet discourse, and one of the things I was talking about was like um, how much th this is relative living, relatively normal living, and, and he was like mondo mondo, and so he wrote an article like how much running out of normal, running out of normal. That was so awesome. Yeah, I was like, it, it, I said I agree. That was my my whole point is we're running out of normal, and uh, and he caught that, and so his article was great. People can check it out rev three ten dot net. But as we watch that we're running out of normal, it just shows us how close we are. I mean, so somebody, and I always like to end it, you know, Lee, someone's been listening to this, maybe a friend put them on. They're kind of wondering what in the world are these guys talking about? What's the good news? How do, they, how do they come to know the Lord? Well, the good news is not only can we escape the trials and tribulations, the wrath of God coming upon the world, we can escape eternal punishment. And we don't escape it by becoming religious or turning over a new leaf or be joining some uh, positive thinking club. We find it by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation. He is God manifest in flesh. God himself in the person of the Son died on the cross for, to shed his blood for the whole world. Every man that ever lived can be forgiven by trusting in Jesus. And he stands forevermore as a high priest at the right hand of the Father with the blood on the altar, able to save unto the uttermost all that come unto him. So it doesn't matter how deep you've fallen into sin, how long you've been in sin, doesn't matter how severe your sin is, doesn't matter if you've been a prostitute for 20 years, you've been a drug abuser for 20 years, you've worked for the mafia for 20 years, you've killed 20 people, it does not matter. You put your trust in Jesus Christ, you can be saved in a moment, escape the coming tribulation and have eternal life in an infinite utopia with an infinite re reward given to you from an infinite God. Yeah, amen to that. Lee, it's been great. It's always a good time. We've had some great uh, couple days of uh, filming here. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Please, again, if you didn't subscribe to us, subscribe to the channel. Also, check us out, prophecywatchers.com, or you can join us in Branson. Uh, again, it's going to be a great time, Lee. And uh, thank you for listening, and we will catch you all next time.